All right, all right, Red Nation. Today we're gonna to be talking about beam hardening. This is an image artifact in CT. We're gonna be talking about it in CT specifically today. We're gonna to be talking about where it comes from, how to correct it with algorithms on CT scanners, then on new CT scanners, how the physics of the acquisition can actually be used to correct for beam hardening right here at How Radiology Works. In our CT scanning, the x-rays are gonna come in. They're gonna have an initial intensity or a number of x-rays we call I naught. That's the initial intensity as they come in before they pass through the patient. We think about a simplified patient, it's just one material. You can think about the x-rays coming in and they're gonna be decreased in the number of x-rays as they go through because they're interacting with photoelectric and Compton interactions. See our videos there if you haven't seen that already. And as they interact, there are gonna be fewer x-rays that make it through and then as they come out, they're gonna have an intensity I. And the difference between I and I naught is what we use to then calculate a property about the material that we call the attenuation coefficient. We make a map of those attenuation coefficients and that map of attenuation coefficients we call the CT number. We have a video on Hounsfield units if you wanna check that one out as well. But for the purpose of today, this attenuation coefficient it's up in an exponent in what's called Beer's Law, but this is an attenuation coefficient. That's what we make a map of. And in actuality, that attenuation coefficient is actually dependent on the energy of the x-rays. So we're gonna talk about the fact that the x-rays come in, there's actually a spectrum of x-rays and there's a energy dependence. So if you remember from photoelectric interaction, if you think of a material, for instance, this is water. These are higher energy x-rays down here, lower energy x-rays down here. If you had one given energy, you look up what energy is, you go to the graph and you say, that's what the attenuation coefficient is. And you can see that as the energy gets lower, the attenuation gets significantly higher. Then you can see our actual values of our x-ray spectra would look something like this. So if we overlay that, you can see there's values that look something like this for our X-ray spectra. So the X-rays that have lower energy have higher attenuation values. So as the X-rays are passing through matter, because the X-rays at lower energy have higher attenuation values, they will be preferentially stopped in that matter. So the lower energy x-rays have higher attenuation values. That's the first thing to remember out of today's talk. So if you have an x-ray spectrum going into the object looking something like this, where again, this is the number of x-rays on the y-axis and on the x-axis is the energy in KEV. We typically call the lower energy x-rays soft x-rays and the higher energy x-rays, hard x-rays. So as the x-rays pass through, we talked about the lower energy ones have higher attenuation coefficients. They will be more likely to stop. That's primarily due to photoelectric interactions. And you can see then that the average energy of your x-ray spectrum will increase after it passes through some matter. So we call that a harder beam because we're moving from softer x-rays on average to harder x-rays on average. Two things to take away here is as x-rays pass through matter, there's lower intensity because a lot of those x-rays were stopped in the matter, but they have a higher average energy. So lower intensity and higher average energy. So now that we know that there's a change in the spectrum, how does that actually affect the attenuation coefficient? So again, we're looking at a similar graph, but for a different purpose, soft X-ray beam. And if you wanna see the average X-ray attenuation of this softer X-ray beam, you will go through and for each energy, you'll multiply how many X-rays are in that soft X-ray beam by the X-ray attenuation coefficient. So you can calculate an average attenuation coefficient for that soft beam. You do the same thing for the hard beam. If you look at the hard beam, now we move to higher energies. So if we do the same thing for the hard beam, you can see that the harder beam 
actually has a lower attenuation coefficient. So as the x-rays pass through, they will have effectively a lower attenuation coefficient when they're interacting. So as the x-rays pass through, you can see the ray paths here, the x-rays are passing through the water, and then they're gonna get measured on our detector and our detector is right here. And after the x-rays go through this water, we would take the negative log of the signal on our detector, and then we'll get projection measurements that look something like this. And these projection measurements, this is the ideal projection measurement. In reality, the x-rays which pass through more material get a harder beam. And that harder beam actually ends up attenuating a little bit less as it passes through the water. So in reality, the x-rays out here, they only pass through a little bit. That beam doesn't get hardened much at all. Then the x-rays that pass through the middle, that beam gets hardened more because it pass through more matter. So our measured values are a little bit short of our ideal values, especially in the long path lengths, which happen in the center of this uniform phantom. So what happens then if we try and make an image? If you've seen our video about image reconstruction, filter back projection, essentially what we're gonna do, is we're gonna take this signal here and we're gonna filter it and back project it, put it back into the image. And what happens is actually in the middle, because the values are a little bit lower than they actually should be, the values in the image in the middle are gonna be a little bit lower than they should be. So this is what we call a cupping artifact. We're gonna back project lower values into the middle and it's gonna look something like this. If we draw a line in this image, and then we draw what's called the line profile, which is the CT number along that line. That line profile will look something like this, where there's a dip in the middle there, and we call that a cupping artifact because this profile looks like a cup. You could take a sip out of that cup right there. You wanna correct that cupping artifact. So the images from a good CT scanner won't come off the scanner looking like this, right? So the CT vendor actually needs to do something to correct for that. And what the CT vendor actually does is in the projections, we can correct for that. As a physicist trying to make a correction to the images, we always wanna try and make a simple model. So the simplest model we can have here is, imagine the body's made up of water. And if we imagine that the body's made up of water, we can correct for this beam hardening in the water itself. So if we have measured values here, we know the X-ray spectrum, we know from the projections here, how much water it's passed through so we can do a correction. What I'm showing you here is something that we call like a transfer function, where if you have an input value on the x-axis, that'll give you the output value on the y-axis. So if the values are very small in the projections, then there's not much beam hardening, so we don't have to do much correction. If the values are larger on the x-axis, then we do have to do some correction. So we're actually gonna end up multiplying those projection values and making them a little bit larger. So that's how we do a water-based correction. Sometimes it's called a pre-correction because it happens in the projection measurements before we do the reconstruction. So we take our measured values in and then we get our corrected values out. If we do that then, instead of having a cupping artifact, we can now actually say the cupping artifact is gone. There's not actually a cupping artifact. If you draw a line here and then do a plot, what you'll actually see is a relatively straight line here. So we have essentially solved or removed this cupping artifact from beam hardening. Okay, so all's fine and dandy. If your object is just made of water, unfortunately there's other things in the human body besides water. And what happens if you have other things in the body besides water? So if you have iodine, for instance, imagine we had that softer beam and that harder beam. And if we look at the change in attenuation, the change in attenuation of iodine, which I've drawn here, bone you could also draw, those are going to be more dramatic than the change in attenuation of water. So if we just correct for everything, assuming it's water, we're actually going to undercorrect for the case of iodine. What happens if we undercorrect for the case of iodine? Again, the same thing like we talked about, 
it's actually gonna lead to darkening in the image. So just like we talked about before, if you have a soft beam versus a hard beam, as you go to a harder beam, there's lower X-ray attenuation coefficients. This effect is actually more dramatic for things like iodine and bone. That's because photoelectric interactions are actually more in those high Z materials. So because it's more dramatic, if we just assume everything's water, we're actually gonna undercorrect in iodine and bone. And if we do undercorrect in iodine and bone, what actually will happen is we're gonna end up having darkening. That darkening is going to be relative to the iodine and bone projections. So this is a rat lung. Inside the rat lung, there's iodine. And so you can see that given the fact that there's iodine there, between the two areas of iodine, there is a dark streak. That's because we're underestimating the values of iodine there, and thus we're back projecting values along there that are lower than they should be. How could we correct for this? The doctors don't like it when there's gonna be a dark streak in the image, right? So the idea is that we could actually estimate where there's bone or iodine. You can do that based on taking your image and then doing some sort of a segmentation process where you can identify the areas because those areas are higher attenuation. So you can figure out where there's areas that are bone or iodine. Then inside of there, what you can actually do is now that we have a map of the bone or iodine, we can actually take what we call a forward projection or a simulation of how the x-rays are gonna pass through the object. And we can count up how much bone or iodine is along each of the path lengths that are gonna be measured in the projection. And then we have a correction value. Just like we have the correction value for water, we can do the same thing, but now for the bone iodine contributions. If you do that, you can see that before corrections, again, you have dark streaks along areas of high attenuation, especially when you have multiple areas of high attenuation, the dark streak will connect those areas. We can really improve that in this case here. So you can really appreciate in this rat lung a significant improvement. Also, if you look at a simplified phantom of the heart, so we have a left chamber, a right chamber, and an aorta, especially for perfusion imaging, there's actually tissue that's right in here that connects the left chamber and the aorta. And the idea is that you want to have a uniform value. So this is a phantom that we have, which is just a plastic uniform value. And you can see the dark streaking again between the big areas of iodine. That's significantly improved if we do a correction. I've shown you some kind of contrived phantoms of a rat lung and a heart phantom it's where it's most obvious because you have these big portions of iodine. In the human body, the area where it's most obvious is actually right in here. And the idea is that you have a lot of bone path length right along this direction here. And you have the posterior fossa right in there. And the posterior fossa is where you'll often see the worst artifacts. So this is where you really need to do this type of a correction. So all the vendors have these type of corrections implemented on their products to do head specific image reconstruction such that you can really reduce the artifacts in the posterior fossa. The question is, we have a number of algorithms to help solve these problems, but can a physics solution where we change the acquisition help solve the problems? And the answer actually is yes. We can actually use what we call dual energy scanning. There's a number of ways to do dual energy scanning. See our videos on the systems for dual energy scanning and also on the actual math behind dual energy scanning. The idea is in dual energy scanning, by taking these two different acquisitions, we can actually decompose the image so that we can make what we call a water basis and an iodine basis. So we estimate the contribution due to water-like material and due to iodine-like material in the image, then we can actually know how these things are going to vary as a function of energy. So because we know how iodine attenuates as a function of energy, and we know how water attenuates as a function of energy, 
we can actually have images that inherently do not have beam hardening. The group that was in Erlangen at the time actually demonstrated this quite well with phantoms in this paper where they looked at from these dual energy systems. If you have a basic dual energy acquisition and you just did a basic decomposition in the image space, you actually would have residual beam hardening artifacts. But if you do dual energy decomposition in the projection space, you actually can correct for all of these beam hardening artifacts. So this is basically demonstrating that instead of using the algorithms that we talked about earlier, the physics of the actual acquisition can correct inherently for these beam hardening artifacts. So now you know why beam hardening artifacts exist and you know the fact that dual energy scanners can correct for that, but see our video on the math behind dual energy scanners so that you can really understand that point that we just made about the fact that we can decompose our image into a water and an iodine basis. Check that one out next.